Uh, my name is Cobb the Graph, and I'll be talking on something a little bit different from most all the rest of the talks. I'll be looking at supermassive black holes uh, using cosmological simulations to look at how the largest black holes can grow and then how they scale with galaxy properties. So to start with, here's just a big picture of the simulation that I'll be using. Um, so this is a gadget simulation, so it's SPH. Uh, it's full hydrodynamics with black holes uh, directly modeled within the simulation. Uh, we've had a lot of talks on simulations, so I'm not going to go into any details on gadget or SPH. But this is a 530 megaparsec box, so it's very, very large. Uh, and it's full hydro. Resolution is good for its box size, but it's certainly nowhere near the galaxy resolutions that people are doing with their galaxy simulations. So most significantly for this, I'll just cover the black hole implementation. So seeding of black holes is accomplished with a very simple friends of friends finder. So anytime, which the friends of friends finder is run on the fly, and anytime we have a halo above 5 times 10 to the 10th solar masses, if there isn't already a black hole there, we seed one with 5 times 10 to the 5th solar mass, seed mass. And that should be generally consistent with either of the commonly considered seeding mechanisms from either pop three stars or direct collapse. Uh, once the black hole's been seeded, it grows through a bondi hoyle type accretion. So we're not resolving the actual accretion disk. We're not resolving anything really approaching the actual accretion disk. But we are able to get a pretty good sense of the gas reservoir around the black hole. And so that's the idea of this sort of model is we're looking at long-term evolution of the black hole, not trying to capture it at any one instant in time. And we have black hole feedback, which is one of the simplest models that you can have. It's just a simple isotropic thermal feedback. OK, so here's just an example of a different simulation, but just showing a whole bunch of different black hole histories. On the top, you've got uh, just the mass histories. And on the bottom are some of the sample accretion rates. So we get a lot of variation in these accretion rates just based on the local gas properties. So the simulation that I'm looking at is very large. It was 500 megaparsecs. So it actually was not possible to run it down to redshift 0. It only went to redshift 4.75. So the main thing we need to make sure of is to make sure that the quasar populations are at least consistent with current observations. So here's the luminosity function of the quasars in this simulation, going from redshift 11 all the way down to redshift 5, roughly where the simulation ended. Um, so you can see nice evolution. I wouldn't trust anything below about 10 to the 11th solar luminosities, because at that point, the mass of the black holes are getting somewhat low, and they'll start to be somewhat sensitive to the seeding parameters. Um, but anything above that should be pretty good. So we can compare that to redshift 5 observations. And you can see it's very consistent at the lower luminosities and also out to the highest luminosities. If we consider redshift 6, we see similar behavior. It's consistent across the whole range of current observations. So the measurements we've got from this simulation are producing the types of black holes that we need in the right numbers. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to discuss clustering here. But if anybody's interested in that, let me know, because we've looked into that as well. So now that we've got the right populations, we want to know how they grew. So one of the big problems with uh, black hole modeling is we've observed black holes that we expect to be about 2 times 10 to the ninth solar masses as early as redshift 7. And that's rather problematic when it comes to explaining how they can get that large. Because even if you assume Eddington growth, and so you just have a simple exponential growth rate, it's going to take a good 10 to 16 E foldings to get to 2 times 10 to the 9. And that's roughly the age of the universe at redshift 7. So it would have to be growing at the Eddington rate for essentially the entire history of the universe, or close to it. And that's going to require significant gas fueling. And you need to make sure that you actually can provide that. Um, so this simulation was large enough. We expected to find some black holes that get that large. And in fact, we do. So we've got about three black holes that get to be 10 to the 9 by red, as early as redshift 7. So here you can see three different mass histories and their associated accretion rates. And then the colored uh, region shows the ten, the, just the region bounded by the 10 most massive in the simulation. So we are producing uh, the right luminosities. We're also growing them to be large enough and fast enough. So then what we want to do is make sure we can understand how they're getting that gas. 
And so what we find is cold streams is really what all it takes to explain it. So here you've got, while this one black hole is growing at an extended Eddington rate, you have high density cold streams coming in that actually penetrate all the way into the very center of the halo where they can fuel the black hole. And that continues until the black hole gets quite massive, at which point black hole feedback really starts kicking in, and you start heating up the gas around it. And you still have these cold streams entering the halo, but they're no longer making it all the way into the central black hole. And that continues afterwards, which is why we have this nice suppressed growth up here. You just have a huge hot bubble basically being pushed out from this black hole. So the cold streams are enough to grow the black holes to 10 to the 9 by redshift 7, and then feedback is enough to shut it down so they don't keep growing to unphysical results. Um, and here's just confirming that uh, gas behavior. This is taking the gas particles that are being accreted at redshift 5 from one of the most massive black holes and tracing them back through time, because it's SPH, we can do it very easily. And we see that when they enter the halo, they're entering the halo at very cold temperatures. That's basically the minimum temperature the simulation allows. And it's only once they get to within a few kiloparsecs that they really start being heated up by the black hole. So these cold streams really are penetrating very efficiently. So that explains the most massive black holes. We also want to look at the less massive ones and consider the more common objects in the universe, the more common among the supermassive black holes. And so what we look at here is we have two simulations, right? Well, the left side shows a smaller volume simulation, which is run to redshift zero. The right side shows this large volume that I've been discussing. And you can see that in general, they all show sort of the same behavior. They start out at sub-Eddington growing slowly. They then get faster. And eventually, their growth is suppressed. So we wanted to consider whether that is really going on universally and if it can be explained in a nice manner. We find that it can. So we, what I did is I took that large volume simulation. I took all the black holes instead of just looking at the few most massive. So there's about 2 million that are being considered here. And I just considered the Eddington rate so just the accretion rate over the Eddington rate, uh, and did that as a function of black hole mass, and found that no matter what you do, no matter what you do, you're always just going to get a nice peak right around 5 to 7 times 10 to the 7th solar masses. So before that, the black holes are growing relatively slowly, but they're growing faster and faster as they grow, until at some point suppression kicks in and they slow down. So we can see that the reason for that shape is coming entirely just from the gas density. So the black dots that I just added on top, that shows the gas density. You can see that peaks at the exact same place as the accretion rate. So this is really being dominated by the gas density, not the temperature. We can see why if we look at the gas density profiles of the halos here. So here are three density profiles. Each one is actually averaging 100 different halos at a given, uh, at a given average black hole mass. So we've got. Uh, blue is at the low mass end, and then green is right around the peak growth rate, and red is well past that. So at the larger scales, you can see that the larger black holes are in larger halos, and they have higher densities. But when you extend that all the way down to the black hole, you can see that the most massive black holes are now somewhere where the gas at the center has all been pushed out, and it's actually dropped down again. And so that's where this sort of peak, ga roughly Gaussian shape, is coming from, it's because you're just pushing the gas out from the centermost region. So even though the gas density outside that centermost region is still high, at the black hole is no longer high enough to sustain rapid growth. And you can see, if you look at the top x-axis, there's the halo mass. And so that's the typical halo mass for black holes of that mass. And we find that this peak roughly corresponds to the expected shock heating scale of a halo. So this is very understandable, simply because at this shock heating scale, the incoming gas from these cold streams is, has the potential to be shock heated much more easily. And that makes it more sensitive to the black hole feedback, which in turn can push it out. So we're getting this nice peak shape and coming entirely from, the, from a combination of the shock heating scale and from the black hole feedback. Um, we can also see the typical evolution in the Eddington fraction. So this is looking at. The Eddington fraction is a function of redshift. Uh, in blue is our simulation prediction. And that's compared to observational data from Yui Shen. You can see that we get the normalization and the slope very, very much correct. So everything there is fully consistent. 
Um, that's all just been discussing what the mean Eddington fraction for a given black hole mass is, but you can also look at the distribution of Eddington fractions. That's shown on these three panels on the right. And you can see it's, it's a very simple log normal distribution. We've got a fitting function here. This is not being fit to each of those curves on the right. The red curves is just a single fit to all masses and all red shifts. And it matches everywhere very nicely. Uh, and includes matching to current observations. So there have been some observations of Eddington fractions at redshift as high as 4.8. So in black there are redshift 4.8 observational data, and then in red is our simulation prediction for the exact same luminosity range. And it all matches extremely well. So this provides a good model, particularly for semi-analytic modeling, if you want to characterize how you expect these black holes to grow without needing information about the host, at least in a statistical sense. So finally, I will discuss scaling relations. So here's the sort of most recent look at the M sigma relation from McConnell and Ma. So here we've just got the black hole mass as a function of the stellar velocity dispersion. So it forms a nice, well-defined slope. And that's part of why we expect black hole feedback to play a significant role in galaxy formation. If we consider our results from this simulation, we get something that looks fairly similar. So here's ours. Obviously, we have a lot more points. Um, but if we put on top the observational data, we can see that even though the observational results are for the local universe and ours are for redshift 5, we get normalization, slope, and scatter are all very consistent. If we put the slopes, the best fitting slopes on top there, in green is the fit from McConnell and Ma, and in red is from our simulation. So we are slightly steeper at redshift 5 than the local universe, but not dramatically so. Uh, it's worth pointing out here that the McConnell and Ma slopes are steeper than most all of the previous measurements of the local universe slope. So they find a slope of close to 5.5, where traditionally it's been more between 4 and 5. And ours is 6.5. So it's definitely steeper at redshift 5 than it is in the local universe. But it's nonetheless not a dramatic evolution in such a long period of time. And it's very helpful that the scatter is still fairly consistent. Um, one of the important things when it comes to making these observations is considering the luminosity dependence. Because at these high redshifts, it's going to be extremely difficult to, to probe with anything except a very high luminosity cut. So we wanted to see if that would then affect the slope of the M sigma relation for many measurements. So here, in the, the gray dashed line is the local relation from observations. And the blue is the fit to our full population. And then if we impose a luminosity cut, you can see that there's actually a red line parallel to the blue. So it doesn't have any, significant, any statistically significant effect on the slope. And that's simply because of that log normal distribution in the black hole Eddington fractions as a function of mass. Some of the very bright objects that you get will be much lower mass objects that are unusually bright for that moment. And if you go to an even higher luminosity cut, you still get the same thing. There's a, there's a very small change in the normalization, but the slope is still consistent. So this is extremely promising because it suggests that when people are making observations these high redshifts, you're not going to get an observational bias based on your flux cuts. But you should it should still be possible to probe the slope, even with a relatively high luminosity. So the one other thing to consider is what happens when these uh, hosts are undergoing galaxy mergers and how that affects the position on the scaling relation. So in green here, I've now considered only the black holes whose hosts are undergoing a galaxy merger at the moment. So obviously, though they're, they're mostly lower mass objects. Uh, they're only cons I'm only considering major mergers here. Um, so they're mostly lower mass objects, but you can also see there's a dramatically shallower slope. And there's a lot, much larger scatter in terms of the relationship. So that's the, the objects in the bottom right corner tend to be dominated by things which have are currently or have recently undergone a merger. Um, and you can see specific examples of that. Here are three tracks of black holes who, which undergo major mergers. You can see all of them sort of, there's a bunch of variation from one snapshot to the next. But they all go up. And then when they undergo a major merger, they just sort of, the uh, line jumps to the right. You have a very rapid increase in sigma. And only after that does the black hole mass increase. In contrast, that here are three which are of similar masses but did not undergo major mergers. So you can see they have a much smoother growth along the, the plane. And that jump in sigma followed by a jump in black hole mass is 
statistically characterizable. So here I've shown the fractional change in sigma and the fractional change in black hole mass uh, in terms of time before or after the merger occurs. So you can see they both grow fairly similarly. And then before the merger really happens, then you start having this jump in sigma. And that's because these halos are starting to pass by and we're churning up all of the stars. And after that, once enough of the gas has been able to, to flow down to the center of the galaxy, then the black hole experiences a jump in its accretion rate and the mass leaps back up again. So the net effect of these mergers is actually to shallow out the M sigma relation, which can partly explain why the high redshift relation is steeper than the, the one observed in the local universe. Um, so in my last 30 seconds or so, I just want to mention one of the things we want to do next. So all of those, sim this work was based on relatively low resolution simulations, which was necessitated by its volume. But it's really important to try running things at high resolution. So here's some work done by Jared Gabor and Frederic Bourneau, where they were running six parsec resolution isolated galaxies. And most of the black hole growth is coming from high density gas clouds that just pass right by the black hole and it causes a spike in its growth. And that you don't get in a lower resolution run. So here is one of those high resolution galaxies that we've rerun at a lower 100 parsec resolution. And you can see in red, you just don't get any of these spikes in growth. So that's the next thing that we're looking at doing, is we want to incorporate a, a subgrid model into Ramsey's to try and resolve, to account for these unresolved gas clouds in the accretion, which will particularly be helpful in the early black hole growth phase. So just to conclude, these very large simulations are able to reproduce the statistical populations of black holes that we're observing in the universe. We're able to grow the very massive, very early ones that have been observed. And that's accomplished through cold streams. Um, the typical growth is well, statistically well characterized by a relatively simple model that only depends on the black hole mass and redshift. Uh, and the M sigma relation at high redshift appears to be very consistent with the local universe, but slightly steeper. And we should be able to make observations of that without worrying about uh, luminosity cuts simply because of the distribution of black hole luminosities as a function of mass. Thank you. Yes. Um, the free parameter, this is the free parameter of the coupling between the feedback, and that's tuned from isolated galaxy models okay. to reproduce the M sigma at redshift zero. Yes. So there are now some data on the M sigma relation higher redshift, and people are finding, from as of today, when this group is CSP, they're finding that the normalization is much higher. Yes. So there might, there would not be the, it would, the, your, your result. I do not think that it would fit these results terribly well, no. Um, the best way to really get a sense of that is the second simulation that's been run and is being analyzed right now and should, results should come out soon. It's a smaller volume than the one I just talked about, but it went all the way to redshift zero. So it'll actually let us see just how it evolves with time. So it's the same model as this one, but that way we can compare uh, the local universe to the local universe and then see what happened at higher redshift and see if it's all fully consistent or if there's something that's evolving as we go. Uh, and also that other simulation is higher at, uh, resolution which is making some slight changes, which I think may account for part of that. <laughs>